And I think there's a tendency for people to, to see like, or view winning hegemony uh, as like this kind of scary, sort of like authoritarian idea. Um, and I think some people would prefer that no one has hegemony and that, you know, everyone just kind of has their own thoughts and does their own thing. But the fact of the matter is someone has hegemony, <laughs> you know, no matter whether it's just the, the uh, political inertia of whatever the prevailing ideas are, or if it's, you know, someone doing entryism or whatever, uh, if socialists don't struggle for hegemony, then uh, the default is liberals having hegemony. And, you know, if other groups get involved and in organize to win it, then they can. But we should be the ones doing that, you know, in the labor movement and, and other sites of struggle. Good. <laughs> to the people. We gave up using headphones to actually see how it sounded a yeah. long time yeah. ago. So, what are you going to yeah, do? Yeah, I think you tried once and that, but I could also hear myself. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And do we both have to wear headphones all the time? Or? Yeah, uh, that'd be two professional podcasters. We, we can't be like that. Yeah, we can't on. be like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, man, tell you what, Dan, this is going to really confuse the listener yeah. because of like the order in which we're <laughs> recording this. I've been thinking about this in terms of like laying little seeds for. <laughs> Well, basically, this is the last thing we're recording before we go away. Right? Yeah. Absolutely last thing. But the interview and then is it's not. All done. But the interview, when it airs at the, in a week's time, is not the final <laughs> thing. So this is, I don't know whether this is the first tidbit of information, the first mm. breadcrumb of like working out the <laughs> the web of what was or- recorded in what order. But it'll really confuse you because I'm yeah. about to say the vaccine that I just got that I talked about getting on another episode that will come out in several weeks kicked my ass. <laughs> Man. <laughs> I uh, got my second dose, which is awesome, but like, woof, yesterday. Yeah, like yeah my second one hit me far more than the first. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's good. It's funny. All the all the people who are like the anti-vax people, it's like, we never gotten a vaccine before? Because like, there's a baseball player who rocks, a guy named Andrelton Simmons, who I just found out is like a Trump supporter, which sucks. And he's like, he tweeted something like, why would I get a vaccine that doesn't work only to give me really bad side effects? um and like blah 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 the typical like crap and i was like have these people just ne- like y- you usually like don't don't feel great after a vaccine mm. <laughs> it's like that is like mm. a normal thing yeah. like <laughs> in the actual part, most people have been pleasantly surprised how yeah. wild yeah exactly. particularly, particularly the mmm mma mma you know the mrna particularly the mrna vaccines have not been affecting people is that the Pfizer one yeah the one that you just said kicked your ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, also, also kicked my ass quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well. But hey-ho. It was weird because I was also like, oh, maybe this isn't, and maybe I actually don't know how this works. But I was like, is this just COVID that's doing this to me? I suppose so, right? Because it is just infecting. Oh, God, let's so not try to pretend <laughs> okay, that we know what yeah. we're talking about. The mRNA ones, I, my limited understanding is something to the effect that... <laughs> They've taken some piece of virus, DNA, coding, okay. whatever, uh-huh. and manipulated it in such a way that it has the effect of teaching your body to make the antibodies. Oh, wow. But it's not actually the, ver- the it's not actually just giving you a, okay. a, 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 a like, yeah. No, yeah, like the normal strategy, obviously, is to give you, well, either well, with the smallpox vaccine, it was like, mm. give you cowpox or something, which was like, <laughs> similar enough that you produce similar enough antibodies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but then also like there is the one which is like we've deactivated it somehow, or it's a limited dose, or it's a smaller dose, mm. which I understand is like the the Oxford AstraZeneca one is using that kind of technology, gotcha. and like the conventional flu vaccine to use that kind of technology. Hmm. Hmm. But fascinating. Don't t- don't take my word. For it. <laughs> I mean, it's so late in the day now. Like, if you yeah. haven't if you haven't tried to like find out, yeah, you probably don't feel so inclined. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. 
I don't know. Whatever. I, I, the whole, the, the vaccine process just frustrates me so much because it's like, man, imagine if this didn't have to do with the market at all, how quickly this would all just be done and everybody yeah. would get it and it would just be fine and we could produce enough for everybody and it'll all be fine. Yeah. But I mean, that's everything, isn't it? Mm. What are you going to do? I mean, we've kind of had that version of what you just described in this country, mm. but it's yeah. just, you can't do it for the whole world in that manner. <laughs> yeah. I feel... oh, well, you could obviously, but like, yeah. well, I mean, also like, I feel like part of the, again, don't take my word for it, but I feel like part of the reason the UK doesn't have as many vaccines as readily available as like the United States, just because the United States just bought a ton. Really. Sure, yeah, yeah. I <laughs> so. suppose so, I suppose so, I suppose so. Yeah. So although we can look at this country and be like, they've got a sufficient supply. I mean, yeah. they could have done it. I, I've, I've, sort of, I've sort of feeling that maybe they, they've done it probably as quickly as they could reasonably have been expected to do. Yeah. I mean, like, there's so many people giving so many vaccines in so many different locations all yeah, over the country. Yeah, yeah. And given that it was organized by the NHS, the NHS knows what everybody's ages are and <laughs> Jack salutes the NHS. <laughs> <laughs> you just get the text and, oh, okay, it's my turn and you book your thing. And yeah, yeah, you yeah. Go, like, Easy peasy. Yeah, it feels a and lot I less think, stressful yeah, out here. Some, I think also some of the, the science that's coming out now is suggesting that a longer wait between the vaccines is more efficacious mm. than just a go, shorter get, gap. Get, uh, interesting. Hmm. So like uh, a yeah, an eight weeks plus gap is more... Um, effective. All right. For long term protection. Yeah. Oh, capitalism works. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> uh, but I've also heard, heard like, um, epidemiologists and the like say that, like, it is an entirely false dichotomy to make the argument that rather than double vax everybody in this country, rather than give top up doses to people who are vulnerable in the autumn, mm. you ought vaccinate the third world. Like, it's a totally um, yeah. false dichotomy. You could do both. Of course you could, yeah. yeah. Ugh. I mean, I'm always reminded of, like, I think there was a polio outbreak or something in New York just after World War II or something, and they vaccinated, like, 8 million people in, like, a month. Mm -hmm. Just like, oh, yeah, we'll just line everybody up, do it quickly, yeah, yeah, make yeah. enough, and yeah, that's yeah, fine, yeah. done. Yeah. <sighs> speaking of mass vaccination, Stan, speaking of the mass party that we're all going to have <laughs> after we all get vaccinated. That was pretty good. Talking um, about massive parties. <laughs> talking about massive parties. We got a, we got a bit of a treat for the old listener uh, this week. Um, we managed to get the one and only uh, Cliff Connolly, contributor to Cosmonaut Magazine, an all-around just cool fella, to come on the show and uh, talk to us about building a mass party. And... Um, Revolutionary sobriety. Two very cool topics, mm -hmm. I feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I dig it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this is not his official designation at all. But I've come to think of him as kind of like the voice of Cosmonaut magazine. Yeah. Yeah, mostly yeah. because um, his primary contribution, which he excels at, is doing audio essays for their podcast feed of their mm. very excellent essays. Or Cosmopod, go check it out, folks. I'm sure you all know about it. And, but... <laughs> and also um, embarking on the massive undertaking that has been recording an audio book version of <laughs> Lars Lee's 600-page tome, Lenin Rediscovered, which we have um, lauded mm. on previous episodes. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, if you've listened to any of that content, then you will know Cliff's voice. Yeah, you'll recognize it for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, we spoke about several uh, very interesting essays that mm. Cliff had written. And also, um, he expounded upon those topics in ways which were um, very educating for me and in ways that I haven't mm. really thought about before. Yeah, very um, enlightening for sure. I mean, yeah, and just going beyond what the essays were. So, I mean, we should say, and we'll have links to these. But um, the essays that we'll be talking about, the articles, one, uh, Create a Mass Party for Cosmonaut, and the other one also for Cosmonaut, Revolutionary Discipline and Sobriety. Um, and we get into some really interesting stuff. I mean, not just about how to build a mass party and what a mass party means and why we need to be concerned about, like, autonomism versus, like, kind of like the singular mass party. Um, but also that second essay I really thought was fascinating and also hearing him talk about it, about, like, discipline and focus in the revolutionary movement and what it means to be a socialist. And we talk about all sorts of stuff. You'll hear Kropotkin's name get bought up. That's pretty cool. Um, you'll hear some guy named Lenin's name get bought mm -hmm. up. Um, but yeah, all, yeah, all around. Very, Fidel. very great to have Fidel, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Fidel's getting up, bought up a lot these days. <laughs> um, from it the listeners' birthday. point of view. <laughs> it was his birthday on Friday. 
It was? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, for the list. Like a couple days ago? Oh, that's nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, damn, we should time these better. Because it's kind of like almost partially begins like maybe a bit of a Cuba series. You'll see, listener. You'll see. Um, But yeah, I mean, we should say thank you very much to Cliff for coming on. It was very awesome. Um, Go check out Cosmonaut. Go check out Cosmopod. Go check out um, everything that Cliff's written. And pretty much just everything they've written over at Cosmonaut because it all rocks. That's all I got to say. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I have nothing to add other than once again immense and um, uh, unqualified thanks to Cliff Connolly for giving us his time yeah. and also for his contribution in written and spoken format to mm. creating very excellent educational content for our burgeoning <laughs> new mass communist movement. Yes, exactly. It's coming, baby. It's coming. Oh, we also talk about DSA, which is very cool. Um, so without further ado... Um, enjoy the rest of this episode. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. How you doing today, dude? Yeah, yeah. Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, right on. Um, We're thrilled. Yeah. Really thrilled. Very thrilled. <laughs> um, if I can keep myself in frame and hopefully for audio levels stay <laughs> fine, then we'll get started. So, I mean, Dan and I both wanted to talk to you, I guess, about those two articles that you wrote. One, Create a Mass Party, and the other one, Revolutionary Discipline and Sobriety. So I guess we'll start with Create a Mass Party. We should say these were both for Cosmonaut Magazine, um, who we've both been reading for like quite some time. Very, very awesome. If any of our listeners kind of haven't checked them out, um, check them out, read these two articles, they'll be linked. But I was really interested in like those two quotes that you used towards the beginning from Mao to kind of frame the question of like autonomism versus like uh, the single party approach, the mass party. And I was just going to read a little bit of that because there's the one quote, which Mao is kind of like pulling from small poetry, I guess, which is the uh, let a hundred flowers blossom and let a hundred schools of thought contend, which like I'm from a very hippie town in California. And like I've definitely (laughs) seen that on like some refrigerator magnets before in stores. Um, And then the other quote that you use to kind of like to kind of push back on that is and I'm chopping this up a bit. But it, Mao said something along the lines of, ours is a great party, a correct party. The Communist Party does not fear criticism because we are Marxists. The truth is on our side. And the basic masses, the workers and the peasants, are also on our side. So I thought that was like a really great way of framing this question of autonomism versus the mass party. And I was wondering if you could kind of like explain to our viewers why that's such an important um way to frame organizing and why we kind of like can't fall prey to these like many autonomous um, groups forming, why we kind of need to collate Mm -hmm. all of our power. Yeah. So I guess to contextualize all of this, the um, Create a Mass Party article was written in response to a couple of articles that colonizing counterpower, which is like an autonomous sort of cancelist um, Marxist organization here in the United States. And uh, so they used that quote by Mao, the let a hundred schools of thought contend, a hundred flowers blossom. And I, really, I didn't want to push back on that so much as just kind of give context to it. Because they just kind of like throw it in the article and they're like, yeah, see, we got to let everybody do their own thing, you know? <laughs> um, whereas like really <laughs> what, what Mao was getting at in starting the hundred flowers campaign was we need to solicit um, input from the proletariat and the peasantry, and especially the intellectuals that are not yet on our side in China, um, and solicit their input, get their criticism, and try to make our one mass party uh, more robust and better suited to their needs, which unfortunately ended in a disastrous failure and purges and lots of people being killed. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I'm not like putting Mao on a pedestal here, uh, but I think although it turned out the Chinese Communist Party was unprepared for the criticism that they were going to face, I do think that that's the correct attitude to have. We should have a hundred schools of thought contending within a mass party that is meant to represent, well, in their case, mostly the peasantry, but here in the United States in the developed core, the proletariat and, and the masses. Sure. Yeah, for sure. And I also thought you did like a really good job of like kind of framing the mass party as something that isn't like scary. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> like I feel like you, you explain. I mean, I don't know if you like come across anarchists and you try to explain this idea. They're like, what? Like one party? Are you kidding me? How that's how is that ever going to work? It's just going to lead yeah. to a dictatorship, dude. 
So, I mean, like, I wonder if you could kind of speak to that too. And like the way that you framed the cadre too, I thought was very, uh, uh, not scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess I should say for, for disclosure up front that I, I'm taking a lot of this from Lars Lee, who is a Canadian music professor, uh, who somehow in his free time has written 800 page tomes about the Russian revolution and about Lenin and, uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know he was a music professor. That's sick. He's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> One of my questions was going to be why you chose to, uh, do an audio book reading of Lenin rediscovered. Um, yeah, but I sort of have the answer to that in the sense that like, <laughs> he's a cool dude. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, these two things are, are heavily tied together. Um, I am not like a representative of cosmonaut. I'm not a decision maker there. I'm just a contributor. So upfront, I'm not like speaking for them, but I would say in general, it is true that Lars Lee's conception of Lenin's thought is heavily influential on everyone that, that works for cosmonaut, much including myself. And I think that he is, is the one who back in the early 2000s did a great job of uh, demystifying um, both how like hardcore anarchists and like hardcore ML Stalinists or Trots will talk about Lenin uh, and his ideas and making it like less scary um, because I think the textbook interpretation of Lenin's ideas is really scary. Like, <laughs> like he didn't believe in the workers. He thought that we needed this uh, dictatorial party to tell the workers what to do. And, you know, that's why everything ended up in purges and Stalin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but real, in reality, Lenin was essentially just applying Kowski's model of the SPD as close as possible to Russian conditions, which was a mass party. This was complicated by the fact that in Germany at the time, it was legal to have a socialist party, whereas under Tsarist Russia, it was not. So there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of worry about how to maintain conspiratia, uh, the fine art of not getting arrested, um, to a mass party model. Uh, it's hard to, to have both mass and underground at the same time. Uh, anyway, I think that's where like a lot of the tension between the, the dictatorial party versus the mass party comes from. Um, but yeah, overall, I would say if, if you dig into what Lenin's actual arguments regarding party organization were, they're a lot less scary than I think the textbook interpretation were given. Yeah, I was just saying to Dan, I think I've, I've gotten very good at taking Lenin out of context, especially the more that I read of like, you know, kind of cosmonaut stuff and like Lars Lee and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, wow, I've been taking him very out of context for my whole life. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, definitely man. guilty of that, too, up until, you know, I started getting into all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I mean, that's just it, too. It's just like, you know, it's the circumstances and everything. And that's kind of not something that we can really like contextualize in our minds, or at least it's very like hard to, you know what I mean? To like put yourself yeah. in Lenin's shoes. <laughs> that's a hard shoes. test. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, so I wondered if you could speak like a little bit about the role of the cadre. Cause like, I really did like how you managed to kind of like frame it as something that was subject to democratic discipline and taking at like, taking forward the will of like the working class and like doing all of these things for them, but also while still maintaining like discipline and um, needing to act like at least somewhat in a relatively like centralized manner. Yeah. I, I would say that's probably the most pressing task facing socialists and communists um, in the global North today. I think that's something that the mass party models both you know in 20th early 20th and late 19th century europe of like the german spd and the austrian workers party and the russian social democratic workers party they all did this really well there's a number of latin american parties today that do this really well um i don't think anyone in the united states is doing this at all <laughs> <laughs> and um whether we're talking about you know marxist center or dsa or you know any of the number of kind of bureaucratic sects or anarchist groups or whatever um this is not something we've mastered um and i, I think that's that's really the main should be the main priority um demystifying it but you know both in terms of uh we don't want to follow the like hardcore ml conception of you know, professional revolutionaries being like the general staff of the revolution um telling everyone you know telling the working class what they need to do and directing things from the back 
Uh, I think that this also gets into the distinction that Lee helps bring out between what a vanguard party actually is and what the, the myth of a vanguard party is. Because, I mean, it's, it's a military metaphor, right? So the vanguard is the people at the front. They are not the people in the back with the generals directing everyone and telling everyone what to do. So when we say we want a vanguard party of professional revolutionary cadre, we're talking about organizers who are on the front lines of labor struggles, tenant struggles, and so on. Um, not people who are, you know, sitting in their armchair reading theory and handing out tasks to, <laughs> to, to people mm -hmm. at, at the front. So that's, you know, what I would say a vanguard party is, what the role of the cadre and a mass slash vanguard party is. Um, you're supposed to be on the front taking direction from the workers and masses you're working with and, you know, not bringing preconceived notions and kind of handing out tasks. Yeah, no, for sure. And that, that kind of, that brings me into like something else that I kind of was thinking a lot about after reading your piece, which was just like, it was, this is a bit more historical, but Dan and I a while ago read something on the German Revolution um, by Reinhard Röhrup. It was just a short essay. And we kind of came away from it thinking that like a lot of the Soviets that were at least formed there were like very spontaneous, um, or at least I did. And it was interesting reading this and being like, you know, the argument that was like, you know, no, that was like, at least in Russia, there was like a lot of work for socialists to like get in there and like actually organize the working class. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, I can't speak to to the German uh, experience. I haven't read on that enough to give an informed opinion, so I won't try. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's very clear if you look into the history of it that the Russian Social Democratic Worker Party was instrumental in forming the Soviets. And actually, the Mensheviks uh, were doing more of that more successfully than the Bolsheviks were. Um, hmm. Although, you know, later, obviously, they ended up on equal footing and then obviously the Bolsheviks won a majority later on. Um, but yeah, they were they were instrumental in setting those things up. Um, it's obvious that like trade unions, even, you know, to some extent, like uh, now, like tenant unions, things like that can pop up organically from the working class. But giving those things a s socialist political direction is not something that's just going to happen without yeah. socialists getting involved. Um, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. You was it, you made the examples of like, was it of Amazon, Amazon United, Amazonians United, and of just a couple other tenants unions. But like, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, even if the spontaneous action of like the working class does bring together, like, or form these organizations, there does need to be like some kind of hegemony of ideas centered around Marxism. Yeah. <laughs> For like Marxist things to happen, like it sounds obvious when you say it like that, but like you know the implications for organizing are like big, I suppose. And I think there's a tendency for people to to see like or view winning hegemony uh, as like this kind of scary, sort of like authoritarian idea. Um, and I think some people would prefer that no one has hegemony and that you know everyone just kind of has their own thoughts and does their own thing. But the fact of the matter is someone has hegemony <laughs> you know no matter whether it's just the the uh political inertia of whatever the prevailing ideas are or if it's you know someone doing entryism or whatever uh if socialists don't struggle for hegemony then uh, the default is liberals having hegemony and you know if other groups get involved and organize to win it then they can but we should be the ones doing that you know in the labor movement and, and other sites of struggle yeah for sure. And a, a proletarian hegemony, for want of a better phrase, would be not dictatorial, but like an affirmation of a democratic world, potentially, if it was um, a sufficiently mass based party that was. Right. You know, As opposed to, project. you know, like a bureaucratic sect doing entryism and. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that I found most refreshing learning about, um, I suppose, maybe the, the sort of neo Kautskyism or the Marxist centrism, or maybe like. McNairism, as, as it applies to like the uh, CPGB in, in the UK, um, is to sort of get away from this idea of uh, the Marxist party as the sect, because I think that's the way that I've always encountered it. It's kind of like um, a few people who uh, you really question how they how they have intend to actually effect any kind of change kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there was another historical example I was going to bring up that you used at one point, which is of the um, 
the Austrian Social Democrats and particularly Red Vienna. Um, mm. I knew a little bit about that history in terms of perhaps like the history of social housing in Vienna, but beyond that, I didn't really know anything about that history. I don't know how much you can speak to it. I was wondering whether you think that's kind of like, I mean, obviously it ended relatively disastrously, but whether it represents a sort of like high watermark for the sort of mass party project or whether you, whether you would contend, contend with that or oppose that. Yeah, I no, I, I think, I don't know, it's stupid to put a number on things, but I would say like 90% of, of the lessons we could learn from the Austrian socialist movement prior to fascism taking power are, are positive lessons. Um, there was obviously some critical errors uh, towards the end in terms of just, you know, not being willing to actually confront the right militarily. Um, but I think basically everything up to that was a really, really positive example. Um, I do think it's easy to look at what they were doing and say like, oh, well, why couldn't the Bolsheviks have just done that? Like that was so much better and more peaceful and democratic and everything. It's like, yeah, well, they weren't in the middle of fighting like a genocidal collection of white armies and American and Japanese invaders and whatnot. Um, so I do think it's important to, to remember, you know, they had much better conditions they were working with. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, my interest in the Austrian movement originally came from reading um, Gabriel Kuhn's um, book. It's a, partially a translation of some stuff Julius Deutsch wrote, and then Gabriel Kuhn gives an introduction, I think. It's really short. It's called Anti-Fascism, Sports, and Sobriety. I'm writing uh, it down. A short essay is our like, yeah. magic word. But okay. <laughs> it's definitely going to be an episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's delightful. Um, it, and it just really goes into the connections between like these three pillars within the Austrian movement, which was the anti-fascist militias, uh, the Republican Schutzbund, um, the sports leagues, uh, which was, I think, kind of the forefront of the cultural organizations they had, and the temperance movement um, that the socialists had a really strong connection to. Um, and I'm straight edge, you know, so I just have that personal bias where it's like, oh, this is fucking cool. Like, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that, you know, it, it, there's a lot of positive lessons there that the Austrians took really seriously, building not just a political hegemony, but a cultural hegemony, this alternative or counter culture of workers, sports and sobriety and anti-fascism, um, you know, even going into like hiking and chess clubs and, and stuff like that. That is absolutely what we should be replicating. We have somewhat similar conditions and that we are not in the midst of a civil war right now. So we do <laughs> have the opportunity to set up these cultural institutions and really build an alternative proletarian culture, which actually is the brunt of what I talked about in my first article, article for Cosmonaut way back in the day. Um, that, you know, we need to take more seriously setting these things up because I think we'd actually see a higher return on having, you know, sports and chess and hiking clubs and things like that than we would on, you know, just kind of the, the endless let's lobby politicians for reforms uh, situation. <laughs> Yeah, building a culture was something I wanted to ask you about because what well, I've always had this idea, I've looked very rosily on that period at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, I mean, across Europe particularly, but also in this country as well, in the UK, um, around this culture of setting up, I don't know, like social groups and like creating not necessarily groups directed toward politics, but as you say, toward hiking or toward reading or toward various types of sport kind of thing. Um, and I always had this idea that, that was a, a successful strategy in some ways because there was this degree of exclusion like the working class was excluded from a huge amount of like cultural realms whether it was like hiking or cycling or um like reading just like cultural works kind of thing um yeah. and i've always had this question as to whether i mean obviously something is never reproducible in exactly the same form later on in history but i always wondered whether that was a result of a type of opportunity that doesn't exist because of a degree of exclusion or whether, I mean, like I was thinking about it today and realizing quite the degree of exclusion there is. So I'm already like contradicting myself perhaps, but um, no, I, I, I think there's you, definitely whether, like, whether there's a question, legitimate question in there. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's definitely like a, a, a question that needs to be posed there, which is that we find ourselves in a very different situation. Whereas, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, European workers couldn't just go to the theater, you know, or see the opera. 
or you know they didn't have access to these cultural institutions so what they ended up doing was forming their own which then existed in militant opposition to the status quo which was obviously very bad for the ruling class whereas now our ruling class has gotten a lot smarter and said nah fuck them let's inundate them with marvel movies so that <laughs> you know they don't <laughs> they don't need to go out and have you know clubs for culture because we've got you know uh, just the the lowest common denominator culture right here available for them 24 7 on a nice flashy screen um so it, it's very different conditions to be creating cultural institutions under um on the one hand it poses a huge issue and that it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to get people interested than it would have been back then when people were dying to have some kind of cultural output um on the other hand it gives us the opportunity to be explicitly, you know, countercultural when we're doing these things and say, hey, you know, we're we're going hiking and playing chess and playing soccer and doing these things because these are things that, you know, raise our health, you know, our level of awareness, our intellectual capacities. You know, these are restorative activities uh, and they exist in direct confrontation with the sort of denigrating cultural activities that bourgeois culture presents us with. So. I think there's a little more opportunity for, for critique and for political education and that agitation perhaps. Um, but it's definitely going to be a struggle to just like get regular people, working people interested in joining a weird socialist soccer mm -hmm. club, you know? Yeah. I mean, real quick too. I mean, there is also opportunity for stuff. I suppose we were just talking about this right before, but like, there's an opportunity for things that capitalist structures still exclude people from that are like completely necessary for life under capitalism. And I mean, like this kind of comes down more so to education that isn't like, you know, given to you at school, but it's like, I didn't know how to do taxes until somebody was like, do taxes. It's like, what to do when you're pulled over, what to do when you're arrested. Like, yeah. I know there are kind of some examples of this in like the communist schools in California. I don't know too much about them, but I mean, I kind of, I absolutely agree that like these cultural like forms need to be like made explicitly socialist but also like there's a huge opportunity for education still that could be yeah. used for the same thing i suppose yeah I, I really think we'd be wasting our time setting up cultural institutions that don't have um some kind of intrinsic political education attached to it like sure here in new york uh we've got a dsa like new york convention coming up in september and i think we already have like a choir and a radio station those are like the two things that NYC DSA has as far as cultural orgs, but there's no like formal basis for them to exist in the rules. So there's a, <laughs> there's a, a proposal being put forward for this convention in September that I imagine will pass because it's pretty uncontroversial just to have a separate designation for cultural institutions as opposed to like working groups that have, you know, like a political campaign they're working on. Um, so you know, one of the things I would love to do, you know, if that passes is, you know, put together some kind of chess club or soccer club or something. But if I was going to do that, if I was going to have, say, like a, some, a sport club for DSA, like I'd be buying copies of sports anti-fascism and sobriety and handing them out to anyone, you know, that showed up to play with us. You know, that's like there's no point <laughs> if we're not going to if we're not going to proselytize, you know, and spread the good word of socialism. That's our job as socialists. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been kind of my fear. Like, why would anybody come and play on my soccer or football team as a put when there's one when the, the local pub has one or like i don't know when there is some other um uh some other way for people to exercise that right part of their lives i suppose um yeah there has to be you know an in intrinsic critique and at the same time like a social fabric that they're getting plugged into like yeah mm -hmm. you're playing soccer with some socialist people from dsa whatever but you know when you're running into trouble with something like i don't know you you got kicked off unemployment and you don't know how to get back on. Well, now you've got a bunch of people who like have a bunch of people on uh, the city council that can say, Hey, you know, call this person. We'll get this taken care of for you. Like there's, there's benefits that come with it. And then when you identify that benefit with these socialist ideas that these people are talking about, you're a lot more likely to go, Oh yeah, maybe, you know, maybe socialism is a good idea. Um, I suppose in some ways this is swinging a little bit towards your other essay on revolutionary discipline and sobriety. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the kind of like Marvel, endless iterations <laughs> of Marvel movies kind of thing. Um, because I really love the framing of um, 
I suppose things in terms of like a social disease to some extent, or like like both drugs, but also like that kind of like cultural production as a kind of numbing of um, our existence, I suppose, or an antidote to the alienating existence of uh, living under capitalism. Um, and so I sort of really was quite attracted to this idea of like fixing or working on the social body and the, the collectivity kind of thing and bringing people together in that um, in that way, I suppose, as a kind of like political strategy, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I found, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I found that speech by Che to the, uh, to the Cuban militia, like just really inspiring. Uh, and it reminded me of a really short, like agitational pamphlet by Kropotkin, um, the kind of anarcho-communist theorist, um, where he, it was, it's called Appeal to the Young or Appeal to the Youth or something like that. Have y'all read that? No. Uh, it's, it's short. I definitely recommend it. I think it's on <laughs> short. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to like hand out homework. Anyway, um, uh, but basically he just goes through all, he's, he's like talking to like, I don't know what, what the parallel would be then, but now, like in today's terms, he'd be talking to like an 18 year old kid just got out of high school. So it's like, he's saying like, what do you want to do with your life? Like you can do this, you can do this, you can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can do all these things. And he just essentially goes through each possible option, you know, available to this young person and says like, yeah, you can be a lawyer. Uh, but you know, there's nothing you can do within the context of the bourgeois law and order that will like necessarily change things enough to, you know, set the working class right. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a section on the doctor where he says, yeah, you can be a doctor and, you know, you can have a house call to a slum and find some lady who's like sick in her bed because there's a factory next door that's pumping shit into the air. And, uh, what are you going to give her? What medicine are you going to give her? What medicine are you going to give her to, you know, have her have a more comfortable bed to sleep on and have heating in her home and not have pollution being pumped into her lungs. Like what pill is there for that? So that's why you need to be a socialist. And that's essentially how he frames this like agitational pamphlet is like, you can do whatever you want with your life, but you know, it's not going to make a difference unless you're a socialist and you're fighting for socialism. Um, and it just, that, that speech by Che where he talks about, you know, we're not interested in fighting individual diseases and individual patients. We're interested in, you know, working on the entire social body. I think that those two complement each other really well. It's a really great way to frame whenever somebody, po whenever your experience a problem in someone's life and you just want to say, but capitalism kind of thing. That's a yeah. much better way of framing that kind <laughs> of like, how are you going to fix this without solving the ultimate problem kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, I suppose the other thing that I wanted to ask you about the article was um, there was a there was a line that I initially thought was from you, but it's actually a quote from Kripskaya where you suggest that um, well, well, what she says is that like um, this is not a not we're not preaching asceticism kind of thing, but rather um, a joy that comes from um, uh, like being part of the community and sort of like a collective joy, I suppose. Um, yeah. How would you, I suppose that article perhaps came in for quite a lot of criticism. Um, <laughs> and how would you sort of answer the, the charge that you're the sort of demanding people like subordinate themselves to a sort of <laughs> martial existence without enjoyment or... Um. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm flattered to be confused with group <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was <laughs> half the organizer or writer that she was. Um, but yeah, uh, that's definitely... A danger you know anytime you're writing something like this where you're talking to people like the audience for revolutionary discipline and sobriety is not like working class folks off the streets you know this is mm -hmm. this is aimed at people who have already taken the step to say i am a communist you know and you know the, this is what i want to fight for um i think it's very empty to say that you know if, you're, if your action isn't going to back it up and i'm certainly not demanding that everyone say that, you know, as I said in the article, kind of defining the role of cadre, like not everyone has the capacity or the skills or whatever, you know, to be able to dedicate their life fully to, to revolutionary activity. And any model that relies on getting like all or even a majority of people to do that is going to fail. Like that's why there's a distinction between rank and file members and, you know, professional revolutionaries or cadre or whatever. Um, so yes, uh, on the one hand, I am asking people who 
are telling me I'm serious about being a communist. This is what I want to dedicate my life to. I am telling them, okay, then like you're giving some things up, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. you can't, you can't just be like going out and partying, drinking, doing ketamine with hipsters and you know, <laughs> for the, for the like, I'm sorry. sorry like, yeah. You're not going to be good at organizing if that's what you're doing and no, you know, people aren't going to take you as seriously. Um, yeah, I only I only laugh because I've heard stories of similar leftists from yeah. your neck of the woods, actually. Yeah, it's really <laughs> ironic that I ended up moving to Brooklyn after. <laughs> Um, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, I, in that essay, you, you, um, I think you describe it as a social hell. And so when you just said, <laughs> when you just said you were in Brooklyn, I initially was a bit taken aback. But now I realize, I suppose you're the perfect in the perfect position to diagnose social hell if you're living in it. Yeah, I, uh, I wrote it when I when I didn't live here yet, okay. and I was definitely, I'm definitely guilty of being like, oh yeah, Brooklyn, that's a neighborhood, right? It's all one thing. <laughs> this is how it is. <laughs> and I think I, I think I described like Greenpoint Williamsburg perfectly. Uh, yeah. but, like, I live in like Little Caribbean. Like no one is like the people I described in that article. Everyone's like from Jamaica in my neighborhood. So <laughs> obviously that does not apply to all of Brooklyn. But um, but yeah, the Williamsburg socialist milieu is uh, it's got some issues. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I yeah, I think that kind of just brings us on to another point of your article, which is like. I suppose this kind of relates to the cadre, but it's also just about like having role models in socialism and about how so many of them now are like um, debauched. I don't know. I don't want to, that's like, like sounds mean, but like, I don't know. It, it, I think we are reaching a point where now that the, you know, the bad S word socialism and even like communism is like leaking back into the mainstream that like we do need to bring like discipline back into it and like say that, hey, everything is political. Everything all around you is political. This is very serious. And now that like so many people are being radicalized by the like planet that we're living on is burning and you know, the disasters of climate change and the ticking clock of climate change as well. That like, I think, I think that we need to like bring discipline back more than yeah. ever. And I think that it's like something that we need to like remind ourselves that this is very serious. So I appreciated that about like having some new role models perhaps in socialism. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think that is not a new phenomenon. Like it goes back to the beginning. Like if Karl Marx is a personal, like <laughs> hero role model of yours, like, I don't want to know you, you know, like, <laughs> it would have sucked to be that guy's friend, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, someone like, I, I think it's interesting too, looking at the fact that back in the day, like, people were wearing like Che t-shirts and, you know, like Che was like widely regarded as like the heroic figure of socialism. And, you know, that was wrapped up in this idea. Of, you know, he uh, was committed to self-sacrifice. He was very disciplined. Um, and again, like, I'm not trying to say like everyone, you know, needs to go to Bolivia and get killed by the CIA <laughs> in service of socialism. Like not everyone needs to have that level of commitment, but, that is, you know, a role model that we should have. Whereas today, the role models you see, you, like, you get a lot more of the, well, if there's no dancing, it's not my revolution. You know? <laughs> and, you know, like, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that. Like, hey, like, we need cultural organizations. Like, we need a social fabric totally for that. But if, <laughs> if you're so concerned about that, that you end up dancing on a burning planet while we all fucking die, like, yeah. I'm not really interested <laughs> yeah. in whatever it is that you're peddling in, in that situation. So yeah, yeah I, there there needs to be a balance between um, between discipline and I don't know the more autonomy uh, mm -hmm. oriented oriented stuff. There, there so needs I am to allowed be. To go, I'm allowed to go dancing. That's allowed. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Dancing is okay for now. <laughs> Yeah. Just kidding. Not on <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, that is that is interesting because it is like so many people, and I think this is more of like a previous generation thing. Like, see Marx and see communism as like this iron fisted like world domination thing. But then there's also yeah. the like Californian ideology esque like neoliberals in disguise, but like also have like a flower crown and like maybe take Molly every now and then. You know what I mean? So it is, it is really interesting, like finding a like, not like a middle ground, but like 
a way of saying, hey, this is really serious. We need to get serious about it. Look at how like crummy all of our lives are because of like the ills of capitalism. Here's what we're going to do about it. But also like, yeah, let's go for a hike every now and then. You know what I mean? Like healthy ways, I suppose. I, really, yeah. I think that was my main takeaway from that article. Yeah, I think I probably picked the most controversial way to make that point too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you name called some people. At the <laughs> I, I, especially right now with all the Cuba stuff in the news, saying that Fidel Castro is the the embodiment of this balance between you know discipline and, and autonomy uh, was probably <laughs> not very popular with certain people. But I, I think it stands. Um, I think if you actually look at, at Fidel and the Cuban Communist Party's record, like the way that they handle political dissent is like well balanced between, you know, Stalinist purges and, you know, I and day kind of, you know, don't arm the working class, you know, let's not have to, you know, it's not too ham fisted and then, you know, we end up getting cooed and killed. Um, yeah, I, 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 before being in government and after being in government, I think like Fidelismo's example is a positive one and, and one that we should seek to emulate at no point did they uh ever try to like assassinate political rivals or you know kind of choke people in a corner like that they democratically and peacefully won political hegemony over the revolutionary movement in cuba and then once in power it, diaz canal did it too during the, this most recent round of protests but there's a story um in the book, I referenced uh, Fidel's ethic of violence, where it was during a special period after the Soviet Union fell apart, which obviously caused huge problems for the Cuban economy and everyone was just kind of like starving and fucked. So obviously there was a lot of protests and Fidel's uh, reaction to this was not to like send out police and riot gear to trample people and shoot people with rubber bullets like we have in the United States. His reaction was to walk into the crowd and start forming discussion circles you know, That's to right. talk to people and mm -hmm. see what their problems were. And then Diaz Canal did it again in this most recent round of protests that was in the news. So, yeah, I mean, like both pre and post revolution, I, I think that the, the Cubans example is is probably the best one I can point to as far as this balance between discipline and autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's when you just go into the crowd and you're like, so how much are you getting paid to be here? And then they go, oh, like, oh, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> I think just as like another uh, another question, it doesn't have to relate to um, either of your articles, but I'm interested, you said that you're in Brooklyn. How is the kind of socialist slash communist scene looking out there? Because I moved out to England like three years ago now. Um, I, I don't really know much about Brooklyn, but hmm. um, I'm interested to know kind of like how things are looking on the ground out there. So I just moved here a month ago um, and I'm unemployed. So I've had a lot of time on my hands to try and like dig into the scene here and figure out what's going on. I'm definitely not an expert. Uh, like I said, I just got here, but from what I can tell, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. There's also a lot of negative trends that I think that, that need to be reversed. Um, I'll make a, <laughs> I'll make a lot of people mad saying this probably, but I think specifically in the DSA, there's a real problem where rather than the membership getting people elected into office and then you know leading them to carry out the policies and, and reforms and fights that we want them to it's very much the other way around um, we have a lot of electoral success here but the electeds kind of like run the show whether directly or indirectly if you go if you show up to like the electoral working group meeting it's like paid staffers of elected people that are like running these meetings so there's very little room for any kind of dissent against whatever the electives are doing, uh, which I think is a big, big problem. And we saw this too in the uh, most recent um, national DSA convention, like the resolutions that were aimed at democratic discipline, you know, kind of disciplining elected officials to DSA membership as a whole, like those didn't pass. Um, I doubt anything like that will pass in September at the New York convention. So that's definitely a negative trend um, that I would love to see you know, Marxist and really anyone who's interested in building a mass party that has an electoral wing that is accountable to the membership of the party. Uh, anyone who's interested in that, I, I think it would be beneficial to work on that stuff. But there's also a lot of opportunities. Like I mentioned, the this um, cultural institutions thing, like we've already got two. We're opening up space to create a lot more. I think that's going to bring a lot of people into the movement. Um, one thing that's really interesting here that I think is a positive example of something the electives are doing is they're kind of hopping on this like base building idea. 
Um, so we have electeds that are like actively using their office to get their constituents to form tenant unions, which is really cool. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. uh, yeah, among other things. So there's a lot of positive stuff going on. Um, obviously, there's a lot of like reformism and liberalism in New York DSA, like every chapter in DSA and the national organization, but it's not um, it's not like a sect where that's just how it's going to be forever. You know, it's, it's a battleground that we can contest as Marxists. And I think that we have a, we have an obligation to do that. It's the biggest socialist organization in the United States. It's got a lot of resources, a lot of people and a lot of potential. So that's what I'll be focusing on. And I know some of the other people at Cosmonaut are too. Yeah, man, that's great to hear. I mean, my experience with the DSA, like back home have been very like, it is definitely a live battlefield, but also cause I come like, where I'm from, it has like a very small DSA chapter. It was also just like, nobody really had any idea kind of what socialism was or what it meant. Um, and even though it was like, I came away like feeling really, really good just because like, it was just not a lot of people even using the word socialist back there. Um, and so it was cool to like meet these people who were like at least open to ideas. Um, but then like at the end of the day, it was all like, all right, go, everybody go do your job, go vote for Biden. And it was just like, all right, like, you know, these like six socialists in the town that I'm from, it's like, we kind of need to do, do a bit better. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It is totally a battleground. And I think like anyone on the left who kind of is just like willing to like give up, it's like, well, there's no real point in that, is there? Yeah. 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 I, I think it makes sense to, to get discouraged. Um, I mean, like I've been kind of discouraged the past couple of days with some of the results from the, the national convention. Um, but as socialists in the 21st century in the United States, I think it's important to realize that we've got it pretty easy, you know, compared to our historical forebears who were getting exiled and shot at and killed and tortured. And, you know, mm -hmm. if the worst that I have to deal with is like getting creamed by some liberals at a convention, like that's... <laughs> Uh, it would be pretty pathetic if I took that as an excuse to give up. Um, so <laughs> I hope that can be some 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 tough love and some encouragement for anybody that's kind of feeling similar to the way I did a couple of days ago. Yeah. Well, and also like 10 years ago, you know what I mean? Like I was, I would have been in high school, but also like I kind of imagine that like these things were being talked about on like, at least like something approaching a national stage. So, you know, it's cool. Yeah. There's well, a lot of it's cool. positive momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, do you have anything else? Uh, no, I think I've exhausted my list of questions. All right, man. Well, are you working on anything else? Any writing, anything else for any other uh, places? I'm, I, I'm taking what I feel is a well-deserved break after finishing the, the Lennon Rediscovered audiobook. Yeah, no um, kidding. What was that experience like? I can't imagine <laughs> sitting down and reading that many words. And uh. it, was, it was great. I mean, I love the book. I like doing these readings. Um, I'm like trained as an actor, so like voice acting is uh, mm -hmm. something I enjoy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an 800 page book, you know, with the translation included. So I did like 600 of it. Um, and the, the final chapter is coming out, I think next week, uh, on all the streaming hey, platforms. So <laughs> check that out. Um, and yeah, definitely. I mean, for anyone who's interested in all the stuff we've talked about, check out Cosmonaut in general and, um, anyone at DSA, check out the, the Marxist Unity Slate. That's a, that's an initiative that some Cosmonaut people have put together. Right on. Sick, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what else you come up with, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion. Till next time. Whoa.